Hi, Ron. Uh, I'm Ben Adam, the Senior Director for the Europe Center here at the Atlantic Council. I'm delighted to be introducing this uh, conversation in partnership with uh, the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council on how Germany can best support Ukraine. As you know, the Atlantic Council was founded 60 years ago with a clear mission, supporting US engagement with allies to support liberal democracy. As we face today uh, the risk of a new Russian aggression against Ukraine, engagement with European allies has been core to the strategy of the Biden administration. Unfortunately, though, we've seen some doubts, we've seen some hesitations and divisions coming from Europe, and especially from uh, Berlin, as we see Germany continuing with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and sending mixed signals when it comes to sanctions or military support for uh, Ukraine. We want to open the conversation today on how the German debate can evolve and how Germany could best support the sovereignty and freedom of Ukraine uh, that is core to the European security architecture. Uh, I'll turn here to uh, Ambassador John Herbs, the director of our Eurasia Center, who has been really a leading voice on this issue for the last few years here at the Atlantic Council to uh, engage the uh, and moderate the, the conversation. I want to say we're uh, delighted to have four great speakers who have been signatories of, uh, I think, a very powerful open letter a couple of weeks ago in the German press, Eastern European experts calling for Germany to change its policy and take leadership in the European Union and in NATO and supporting the freedom and sovereignty of uh, Ukraine. Ambassador Herbst, I'll turn it to you. Thank you. And uh, Thank you. Um, I would add to what Ben said that um, it's not just what's of best support from Germany for Ukraine. It's what's, what's the best German policy for dealing with a rogue Kremlin and for enhancing its own security, Europe's security, and transatlantic security. Okay, we have a wonderful group of panelists today. These are folks who put together this extraordinary statement from German and other European intellectuals calling for a change in what they see, and I would agree, as a very weak Berlin policy towards a rogue Kremlin. We have Dr. Andreas Umlon, the research fellow with the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. We have Ruprecht Polenz, the president of the German Association for East European Studies. We have Rebecca Harm, an old friend of mine, the former member of the European Parliament with the Greens. And we have Dr. Sarah Kirschberger, the department manager of the Institute for Security of the Christian Albrecht Universität, Su Kiel. So with that, let us begin. And um, Andreas, I'll start with you. I understand that you were a organizer or the organizer of this statement, and congratulations on that. Um, why did you decide and why did you and your colleagues decide to issue this statement now? The obvious reason is the urgency of the situation now and the previous tendency of Germany to react to such situations um, uh, mostly rhetorically. So uh, the paradox of the basically last 30 years of German policy towards uh, the new post-Soviet Europe has been that many good statements were made, many good diplomatic moves were made, um, and also much support was provided by Germany for countries like Ukraine in terms of development, culture, uh, science, and so on. But when it came to the hard uh, power issues, then Germany has often failed to actually implement its uh, um, its good statements into a political practice. And uh, now we have a very dangerous situation, as probably everybody agrees in Eastern Europe. And um, the original title of the statement sounded like um, Russia's attack on the European security order. Um, Germany must uh, act now. Um, that has actually, that uh, heading has disappeared from the German published version. It has, has been uh, put in there. And this Germany must act um, and not just, you know, make good statements and, and provide political um, diplomatic support that there has to be some action which goes beyond developmental aid for, for Ukraine. Um, that has been, at least from my point of view, the main message of all of this, also against the background of the, I would say, altogether unsuccessful previous attempts to have dialogue with Russia to try to solve these issues um, earlier with Moldova, with Georgia, um, uh, through diplomatic means. There was the so-called Meseberg process. There was an attempt to solve the 
Georgia um, issue, and all of that has failed. And it has also failed then with regard to Ukraine, Crimea, and Eastern Ukraine. And now things are really coming together. And now uh, Germany, I think, has to urgently change its po its approach and position. The the old approach simply has not worked, as good as it may have been. You know, in as as well as the intentions may have been of um, this sort of diplomatic dialogical approach, uh, it simply has not worked. And now we need some action from Germany. <clears throat> okay, Andres, thank you. Uh, Rebecca, how would you describe the inadequacies of current German policy towards Russia? I think uh, for uh, Germany and uh, also in this context, we published uh, the statement, it's uh, very, very important to recognize that it was wrong that never German governments adapted uh, their strategies towards Russia according to what we observed, uh, what Russia did under the leadership of Vladimir Putin. So still the German strategy towards Russia is rooted in this idea, the old idea of rapprochement and trade and that this might achieve change to the better. Uh, I would like uh, to remind uh, everybody, especially in, the, in Germany, that uh, we saw the opening of Nord Stream 1 uh, in the year 2011. Now we are 10 years and one real war later. We are after Crimea, after Donbass, after MH17 and lots of cyber attacks. And Nord Stream 2 is in this very moment operational. Putin in the same time has amassed his army for the second time in one year along the borders of Ukraine. The truth which gets visible in this very moment and which many German politicians and also citizens still do not want to see, the truth is that our German-Russian Gazprom strategy supported and improved the conditions for Russian warfare against Ukraine. Parts of Germans' way of uh, rapprochement uh, was also in the same time to block Ukraine's way not only into NATO, this is often discussed, and uh, so there might be reasons, uh, acceptable reasons for some Germans, but Germany blocked the way for Ukraine into NATO and in the same time, already before, into the European Union. By this strategy, Germany also is sending the message and this really uh, is reflected uh, in the public mood in Germany that uh, Putin's big lie that Russia has been encircled and became uh, and came more and more under pressure uh, by possible uh, attacks through uh, NATO. Uh, this message uh, was whether voluntarily or not was uh, really uh, underpinned. And um, in the light of the actual situation, I think uh, it's very important that we um, in Germany reconsider the mistakes, the misconceptions um, and um, the failures of what has been in the core of the German strategy towards Russia. Rebecca, thank you. Nice and comprehensive. Ruprecht, where does this policy come from? Traditional SPD Auspolitik, the political weight of what had been East Germany in German politics, or the business community, for instance, the German Eastern Business Association? Thank you, John. This is a very good question because if what we have heard, um, you could not understand uh, German politics uh, not answering in the, right, in the right way. What are the reasons for that? I would say first, um, there is an, uh, a deep-rooted feel of guilt because of the Second World War and the attack against Soviet Union. But of course, uh, it is forgotten that most of the victims 
were living in today's Belarusia and Ukraine. Uh, in the German uh, view, uh, uh, Russia is the same uh, as Soviet Union, which is a huge mistake in the, in the perception. Second point, gratitude to re reunification. We always uh, said in the, I'm a bit old, I, I know from the 50s, 60s and 70s, it was a phrase that the key for the German question is in Moscow. And this, when re reunification came in uh, 1989, 1990, uh, this uh, uh, improved the perception that it was mainly Gorbachev who uh, allowed uh, reunification and it was underestimated what uh, the NATO double track decision did and uh, what, uh, what Reagan did, what Bush did uh, and so on and so forth. And the third point is, uh, there is a sense uh, that we might not have uh, security in Europe without Russia. We need to include Russia in some kind of security arrangements. And uh, 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 a sense that we are now again in a situation maybe more comparable with the Cold War with a big difference, of course, that we also now have China on the other side, so we are not in a bipolar uh, situation, of course. Um, uh, these are the main uh, mispercep misperceptions uh, in, in my view. And this, a last remark, my feeling is, if you would ask uh, ordinary Germans in the street, what are, your Eastern what are our <laughs> Eastern neighbors? Most of them would mention Russia first and then maybe the Poles, the Baltic states and others. And this kind of misperception, Russia is our most important neighbor in the East, is also leading to this kind of misperception and I would I'd say confusion in the German public debate. Oh, thank you, wonderful answer. Sarah, you call on Germany to abandon Ostpolitik, which has been associated with the social Democrats. But isn't this problem more than just a left-wing phenomenon? For example, Bavarian leader Yoda recently gave an interview saying Russia is not Europe's enemy. Please. Thank you, John. Yeah, I think uh, actually the statement doesn't really um, call to sort of condemn Ostpolitik as a historical phenomenon because it was probably very well suited to the past situation when it was invented in the 1970s. It helped definitely to ease uh, Germany, the divided nation, Eastern Germany and Western Germany, to, to sort of find a way to get along better and be represented jointly in the international arena and so on. So there was, was, a, was a rationale for us politics. But what we see now, and this is, I think, what our statement um, calls for, is not to use the past experience of us politic as a fig leaf to cover over the complete lack of realism and strategy in the face of a completely different current situation. So people look at this um, Ostpolitik as a nostalgic um, way of saying we never need to adapt our thinking to new realities. And this is really what's so mind blowing about, um, in my view, per, in my personal view, about the Berlin's approach to, um, to Russia. And I completely agree that this is not only a, a uh, phenomenon associated with the left uh, in, in Berlin with the SPD. It's, you can find proponents of this line of thinking in all the, all the big parties, as we have seen recently with the statement um, by the Bavarian politician Suda, who is uh, from, from a completely different part of the political spectrum. So this is something you often hear and I also would like to emphasize, it's indeed true, um, there is a heavy dose of arrogance in this line of thinking as well, I would argue. It's an arrogance that seems to think that the experience of the actual neighbors of Russia, which are not Germany, which are Poland and the Baltic countries and Ukraine and Finland, where my family is, happens to be from, that these experiences are somehow not valid or not as as you know, sophisticated, the thinking is not as realistic as what we Germans come up with. So I, I sense in a lot of these ideas that are often connected with the word Ostpolitik coming from Berlin, a sense of um, Germans know best how the world should function. And at the same time, a, a complete ignorance of the way that this behavior is perceived in the outside world. 
So if, if you do not insulate yourself from the feedback of our ally, allies and friends in the world, whether from Israel even or from Eastern Europe, you, you get a sense that we are seen as, as completely out of touch with reality. And this is, I think, the important uh, lesson to the necessity to learn from the past, but not take the past into the present as if circumstances hadn't changed. Okay, thank you. Wonderful answer. Andreas, I see you, your hand is up. I was going to ask you the next question, but do you want to respond to something that Sarah just said? Yeah, just as you mentioned, the sort of left-wing element here, what we have now in, in the German Bundestag is that actually the far right is the, the strongest supporter of, of Putin, and which I think should also make people in the Social Democratic Party and also in the left-wing party think. Uh, so this is the party that is most resolutely supporting the annexation of Crimea, that has the closest links now uh, to, to the Russian regime that is uh, supported by uh, Russia today and so on. And I'm just wondering sometimes, you know, how, how can the, the, the both the social democratic and left wing um, um, deputies and, and party activists uh, see all that and, and not recognize that there's something wrong? Fair point. Okay, Andres, next question is for you. Is there recognition, do you think, in Germany that the close economic times with Russia at the heart of Ostpolitik have in fact given the Kremlin more influence in Germany than Germany influence in Russia? Yes, I think now people realize that, uh, especially with the recent gas uh, crisis and the, let's say, uncooperative be behavior of Putin in this, uh, the, the gas crisis was not caused by Russia, but uh, Putin has not helped uh, Germany uh, and the European Union in this situation. Instead, the help has come from other allies, uh, including uh, the United States and uh, the uh, gas storage um, uh, installations that Gazprom, for instance, has in, in Germany are, are uh, partly empty. Um, in general, I think perhaps the, uh, the approach was well meant. It's what, what Rebecca already meant this idea of approximation or rapprochement through entanglement. The idea behind here is basically interdependence theory and that, uh, you know, we would get uh, economically tied and then we would uh, become closer to each other. But uh, um, one of the reasons that, uh, you know, I was also um, initiating this was that, unfortunately, this, this has not worked out. It has worked out, uh, as you indicated in the question, to the contrary. Um, Russia has modernized over the last 30 years with the help of Germany. Uh, we have closer economic ties, but unfortunately the political spillover effect has not happened. That was the intention of the sort of um, interdependence strategy um, approximation through um, entanglement. And what, uh, and what has happened is, in fact, is that Germany has furthered the disentanglement, the economic disentanglement, of Ukraine and Russia. And as Rebecca has already indicated, this has then actually pre uh, prepared uh, the Russian attack on, on Ukraine because Russia, um, as a result of Nord Stream 1 um, that went online, the, the second string went online in October 2012, then immediately increased its pressure already under Yanukovych. Uh, we, we saw uh, an enormous uh, economic political pressure on Ukraine as soon as the first Nord Stream pipeline had, had gone online. And so this whole strategy of uh, interdependence, of uh, entanglement and approximation, rapprochement, has simply not worked. And we even have this sort of ironic statement in this state, um, uh, sentence in this statement that it has worked in a, in a very tragic, tragic, comic way in that the, um, the geographical, there has been a geographical approximation between the borders of the EU and the sphere of influence of Russia, which has uh, moved to the West with the annexation of Crimea, with the occupation of the Eastern Donbas. And we have actually an approximation, but not um, a metaphorical one or a political one or um, a normative one, but a geographical one. Um, that has been the, the sad result of this whole economic strategy. Thank you. Um, Ruprecht. Germany has been criticized for blocking the decision by Baltic nations to send weapons to Ukraine. Why did the government do this? After all, this did not involve German weapons. There is, uh, there is a general understanding in the broader public in Germany 
that, uh, let me put it very bluntly, weapons are evil because they, were, they are used in, in war. And therefore, Unless those weapons are Russian. Yeah, uh, yeah, but but uh, uh, from this from from this standpoint, we have a very restrict uh, policy, uh, very restricted guidelines for the export of weapons, and uh, of course, uh, it is misleading to think we are on moral high ground if we don't help a country which is uh, threatened by an aggressive uh, country like Russia. And uh, there is also in our in our uh, guidelines for 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 weapons uh, exports uh, an exception that if there is uh, the uh, a case of self defense according to the Charter of the United Nations, uh, it should be allowed. And of course, I'm harshly criticizing uh, the government that they are at least uh, looking like if they would block, especially Estonia and others. Uh, to, to deliver weapons to Ukraine. Uh, this is the minimum to allow the others to do what they think is the right thing to do. And I would add, I personally advocate uh, that also Germany should help uh, to, uh, to increase the deterrence capacities of Ukraine uh, via weapons delivery. Thank you. All right. Uh, and I thank you all, by the way, for your concise answers. That keeps things moving nicely. All right, Sarah, Nord Stream 2 remains a point of real controversy. The German defense minister said there was no connection between the Russian possible inv new invasion of Ukraine and the pipeline. Chancellor Schultz has been meticulous to avoid actually saying that Germany would shut down Nord Stream 2 if those Russian troops go into Ukraine. Uh, will Berlin agree to shut down the pipeline? In fact, Moscow sends those 100,000 plus troops into Ukraine. Well, I am, of course, not privy to um, what's going on behind closed doors, and I can only guess. But um, I think our chancellor has recently um, shown signs of walking back from that statement that Nord Stream 2 is only uh, an economic project and is absolutely not being considered as part of the sanctions package. So the recent sense that I get out of Berlin is that the pressure coming from the outside, mostly from the allies, has been so great that uh, Berlin will find it very, very difficult to justify uh, letting Nord Stream 2 go online in the face of, of armed aggression against Ukraine. So what I would expect in the case that war actually breaks out, which, I, which of course I hope will not happen, uh, which I, what I would expect to see is that of course also the public pressure would be too great for our government to insist on still operating Nord Stream 2. I think it would not be politically feasible to keep this line. However, um, by not making Nord Stream 2 explicitly part of a sanctions package um, as openly as our allies, allies would like, we are, of course, somehow weakening um, the Terrans because this is just one part of, of the whole package. And we consistently talk about what we are not willing to do. Like some politicians have said, like Friedrich Merz, we cannot uh, stop uh, Russian access to the SWIFT system. Others say we cannot stop Nord Stream 2. Still others say we cannot not deliver weapons ourselves and even our allies should not deliver them. So we basically, um, we, we take everything off the table, which leaves, leaves up with nothing. And, and this is precisely what the Kremlin likes to see, a weakened and divided opponent that doesn't know what to do. This is precisely uh, the goal, to show that the West is disunited, weak, unable to act. And this may be the whole goal of this operation that we are seeing, to basically dismantle the idea that NATO and the EU are some, some sort of force to reckon with. And in that sense, I hope very much that our government will come around to see the point of view of the allies and become a bit more open about joining a sanctions initiative. And I would expect in the case that tensions really, uh, really, really escalate that this definitely will happen that uh, Nord Stream 2 will be sanctioned. L let me ask you a follow-up question on this. Uh do you think that the Biden administration has coddled uh, Berlin on Nord Stream 2 and, in fact, enabled them to pursue this disastrous Ostpolitik? 
I know that the Biden administration and of course previously the Trump administration have put enormous pressure on Berlin regarding Nord Stream 2 and I've also asked um, American friends why did you drop the pressure why didn't you just keep pressuring us about this and the answer that I received was it was decided at some point that sanctioning an ally is not going to be helpful it's just um it's, it's just like counter, counter, not, not productive, counterproductive. So that was the sense coming out of, of the administration apparently. And I'm, I'm of the opinion that this was wrong. I think the Biden administration should have um, followed through with the threats of sanctions. But the problem is in Germany, there are vested interests supporting this pipeline that go, you know, not just through our ex-Chancellor Schröder's connection. They go to the federal state of Mecklenburg-Vorpommern where with Russian money, a federation was established supposedly for environmental protection that serves as a vehicle for evading sanctions. It goes down reportedly to the interest of various communes in other federal states that have like sort of financial interests connected with this pipeline. So this is a, a very huge, um, uh, interest group within Germany and it will be very hard to um, change the facts about this pipeline without continued uh, pressure. So uh, I'm, I'm a bit sad that uh, the Biden administration caved in. I, I think the Biden administration made a serious mistake and they actually, the argument that this was sanctioning allies is, is a false argument because you'll be sanctioning actually Gazprom companies. Not at not tech, not German companies. But anyway, okay. Rebecca, your hand is up. I know you want a response. In fact, the next question is coming to you, but please, what do you want to say here? Now please unmute yourself. I only wanted uh, to add to what Sarah said uh, that it might be important uh, to um, think about uh, that uh, sanctioning an ally might not be reasonable was a serious thought uh, in Washington because it could now increase the pressure on Germany uh, to, uh, to, to really uh, include Nord Stream, at least Nord Stream 2, into the sanctions package. Um, I find it um, more and more important to have the discussion in Germany about the sanctions. The Germans were always keen uh, for this um, uh, Russia problem to argue uh, that we will not have a military solution, but we will have other ways to solve the conflicts. And the alternative they offered in Germany to the public was always, we will use economic sanctions. So far, the economic sanctions we used were less effective as they could have been if we would have been ready to pay our own price for the sanctions. So um, this is, uh, I think, more and more clear that economic sanctions will be efficient only uh, if uh, Germany and others are willing to pay also a price for this concept. And to discuss this in our countries and societies is the right moment. And, uh, so therefore also, I very much uh, uh, liked the preparations of uh, Andreas Umland's uh, work um, and this statement uh, to really focus on what has to be done. There is this necessary debate uh, on weapons and weapons delivery. I would myself so personally be already happy if Germany would stop uh, to hinder other partners, partners to deliver uh, weapons. Uh, but I would in the same time say, Germans, you have to be serious about real harmful sanctions. Rebecca, my next question is for you, but I see Andreas has his hand up on this. So Andreas, please, I'll come back to you, Rebecca, in a minute. Yeah, just very shortly, if I may intervene. I mean, the, the this Nord Stream 2 discussion is a little bit odd because it's, of course, not a sanction in the sort of original 
way of the meaning because uh, it's not yet, uh, uh, it's operational, not stream two, but it's not operating. So it's not actually a reduction of the current economic activity. And it's also happening against the background that there is a, a large overcapacity uh, for transporting Siberian gas into the EU. And actually much of this capacity has not been used last uh, last year. And the original discussion about Nord Stream 2 was about um, that it would um, reduce the remaining economic leverage that Ukraine has still vis-a-vis um, -vis Russia, that it is now currently still uh, controls a relatively small uh, compared to earlier share of the Russian gas transportation. And once Nord Stream 2 goes online, then uh, there would be no need for the gas Ukrainian gas transportation anymore at all. So um, in a way, it's a, it's a bit of a distraction from the actual sanctions, because the, it's not yet a sanction, really, as long as, uh, uh, as it's not operating. It reminds me a little bit the sort of pseudo discussion about the uh, 2014 sectoral sanctions that were introduced on 29th of July. Um, in 2014, in obvious reaction to the um, to the shooting down of MH17, the odd um, aspect of these sectoral sanctions that were introduced in uh, July 2014 was not only, as Rebecca mentioned, that there were minor sanctions; they only uh, concerned very specific technologies and financial instruments. But these sanctions were were oddly imposed at a moment when the Ukrainian army was in the offensive. And when in, in, in the second half of July, it actually looked as if the whole thing might be over in a couple of weeks. Uh, and at that point, um, the EU imposes sanctions, sending the signals thereby to, to Moscow that what is important is not actually what is happening to Ukraine, because Ukraine was winning at this moment. What is as important is that Putin should not kill uh, EU citizens, as he did on, on 17th of July, when the book uh, shot down the air, airline and, and more than 200 EU citizens were killed. And so that was actually the wrong signal. It was not a good sanction. It was a punishment of Putin for killing over 200 EU citizens and was actually unrelated to the actual developments on the ground and the, and the, uh, and, and the war that was going on. And it, it, it then led Putin to conclude, you can do what you want on the ground. You can kill as many Ukrainians as you, as you want. What you should not do is you should not kill EU citizens. Then you get sanctions. Then uh, the EU becomes uh, becomes serious. So we have these sort of pseudo discussions about sanctions that then sort of they and and they constantly mentioned you know we have these sectoral sanctions and we have but that was a very ambivalent issue and and Nord Stream two is now also turning into these this ambivalent issue and is distracting from the actual issues at hand and. Uh, the still ongoing enormous role that the EU plays for Russia as a trading and investment partner. Thank you. Okay, Rebecca, um, in recent years, we have seen direct Russian interference in German elections, the poor Lisa disinformation outrage, the assassination of a Chechen dissident in Berlin, yet these Russian provocations did not produce much of a response in Germany. Why? Please unmute. Yes. Um, so I disagree a bit um, to this perception because um, I think um, it created a lot of attention, but it never created, um, it, it never had real consequences. So considering the whole issue of disinformation, my view on Germany is so far uh, that um, as a society, we have not yet really understood uh, the issue and the risks of uh, disinformation. There is a feeling in our liberal and pluralistic uh, society that we still can cope with these new challenges. But for example, regarding some of the big lies fabricated uh, in Russia, this still has to be proven that we are that we are able to cope with it because uh, i feel that parts of the public discourse are already uh, deeply influenced uh, by the uh, faked uh, russian narratives 
Um, on the second issue, so the um, the uh, prosecution um, and uh, oppression um, of um, dissidents and uh, opponents uh, of uh, Vladimir Putin and his regime inside and outside of Russia. So there is a lot of public attention uh, to uh, the uh, big cases. Uh, it started with Politkovskaya, yeah, it continued with Nemtsov and uh, Navalny, you still remember also uh, the case, uh, the cases now against Memorial as a consequence of this foreign agent law gets a lot of attention in Germany. But um, as um, I said before, um, all this attention, all the German empathy, all this we stand uh, with Memorial has no consequences uh, in the German official strategy uh, for Russia. And my hope right now in a very dark and uh, frightening moment uh, concerning uh, the confrontation along uh, the Russia, the, the Ukrainian border. Uh, so uh, my hope still is that with a new parliament in Germany, with a, a new composition uh, of this parliament, with the liberals and the greens uh, in government, and also some uh, of um, uh, quite well reputed um, uh, human rights uh, politicians, <coughs> social democrats, we might be able to also think about new approaches because of these experiences. So something has to happen. Germany cannot only always argue about support of civil society and if civil society gets under such pressure, continue business as usual with a regime like the regime of Vladimir Putin. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to do one more round of questions, and please see if you can keep your answers to two minutes so we have time for audience questions. Andreas, uh, Vice Admiral Kai Achim Schoenbach recently left his post after saying in India that Putin deserved respect and Crimea would never return to Ukrainian control. <clears throat> An article in the Neue Zeitung <clears throat> Zeitung suggested that many influential people in Germany, in fact, agree with the Admiral. What, if anything, is the political significance of this incident? Well, actually, for me, it was an altogether encouraging incident because of the swiftness with which uh, the Admiral was then dismissed or was asked to um, take his leave. And uh, I was actually pleasantly surprised by by the, the speed with which with this was happening and, um, and the sort of uh, clear reaction from the Ministry of Defense and, uh, and the German government. So in a way you could see that, um, I, I see mm. the, the glass more half, half full here than half empty. Uh, but still, I think, you know, he, he expresses pretty much what is uh, sort of seen as, as common knowledge uh, in, in Germany, um, which has a lot to do with the fact uh, that, uh, you know, the sort of Russian narratives are widespread um you know the, uh, the crimea is not well understood and uh, and also ukraine i think has failed to to press its narrative effective enough and to to create enough uh, sort of cultural institutions and initiatives that would uh, spread um the uh, the ukrainian narrative so that has to be also critically said here um, uh, most of the activities uh, from the ukrainian side for instance representing um, the uh, Ukrainian history of, of Crimea, um, uh, th these initiatives largely came from uh, diaspora organizations, from civil society organizations, partly from the Ukrainian oligarchs um, that have been financing um, initiatives, oddly enough, uh, and not so much from the Ukrainian state. Um, uh, there was even some critique by the, um, I was in one discussion where the um, uh, Ukrainian ambassador to Germany uh, Andrei Melnik was actually criticizing his own ministry or the history of his, his own ministry of not devoting enough money to uh, cultural diplomacy. So um, that we see now the result of that. And unfortunately, the, um, the sort of view of, uh, of the admiral uh, is not uh, is not limited to him. Uh, maybe it maybe it's with the with the military men. Uh, my speculation is here also that they sort of they study the history of wars in Europe and uh, for them, you know, the Tsarist Empire uh, and Soviet Union are important and they simply 
don't know what to do with countries like Georgia, Moldova, and um, and Ukraine because they are not on on the sort of on the screen for them uh, because they they have not existed, and and they don't go then into the details of the inner life, let's say, of the Tsarist Empire and the connections that um, Crimea had both within the Tsarist Empire and the Tauric government uh, with mainland um, Ukraine or within the Soviet Union in the uh, Ukrainian. Um, Soviet Republic with uh, with the territory of to, of today mainland uh, Ukraine. So unfortunately, these are um, his his statements are just symptoms of of uh, larger problems uh, that Ukraine's image and Ukraine's history has in presenting itself in in Germany. And my suspicion is even in in many other countries as well, um, at least um, of continental Western Europe. Uh, I think uh, Germany may not actually be the, the most problematic here. What I hear is actually is that Italy is is, is much worse uh, even than than Germany. Um, so you know the, the the sort of mainstream discourse there in in uh, in the major media outlets seems to be far worse than the one in uh, we have in in Germany today. Okay, thank you, um, Rebecca. Um, survey, a recent survey showed that while 47% of Germans are opposed to delivery of defensive weapons to Ukraine, 42% are in favor, so almost 50-50. Recently, there was a statement by the CDU leader Mertz considering sending German defensive weapons to Ukraine. Um, are you encouraged by these developments? So right now I'm encouraged because uh, partners uh, in NATO and EU states are delivering weapons uh, to Ukraine. Um, I'm um, not sure whether, as I said before, whether my country, my government will be able to join uh, this uh, delivery of uh, weapons soon. Um, I also, I, I'm, I'm hesitating to talk about uh, defense weapons. Um, this is also, uh, I think, quite a German debate. Uh, Ukraine needs weapons to be able to defend itself. And um, Germany, if drawing conclusions from our own history, uh, should not um, stand aside and look if that uh, so and look from the fence that uh, a big country is um, is uh, dismembering uh, a small country so our role should be um, to um, to to develop a better solidarity and uh, we have to decide uh, much more clear our contribution to a deterrence um, for me, uh, the question um, around weapons uh, will soon lead uh, to fundamental questions uh, to Germany as a partner in the European Union and uh, in NATO. Uh, the recent uh, stories published about uh, problems for Estonia to deliver weapons uh, or UK uh, with uh, their flights to deliver weapons are circumventing uh, the airspace uh, of Germany because they fear they will not get the permission. So these are stories um, a country like Germany cannot afford in the context of this, uh, what also should meanwhile be called a crisis with uh, Russia. Um, I'm not sure um, whether um, for us uh, this uh, will um, end with the del delivery of German weapons, uh, but uh, if um, we as Germans would learn right now that we cannot be a very influential power in Europe and we cannot be uh, influential in NATO, uh, with uh, in the same time uh, in such a crisis uh, asking for kind of a neutrality status uh, on such a crucial issue. Uh, I think if we do not recognize this, uh, then Putin is uh, very successful. But honestly, for the Germans, the weapons delivery debate comes late, too late for the actual crisis probably. And as I said before, to prepare us 
to be ready to pay a high price with economic sanctions ourselves. So the price shield, what's always mentioned, is not only a price shield for Russia, but it's a price shield for our solidarity. And this debate for the Germans uh, should be the priority right now. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, all right, Ruprecht, what do you think has been and will be the impact of your statements? I hope that we can, uh, let's say, bring out the fog of disinformation and misperceptions of the heads of some of the German politicians and also of the wider public and also of some journalists. I think we can uh, sum up the message of the statement in one sentence. Putin wants to create a front yard from which democracy and the rule of law will be driven out in the same way as he did in Russia. Those are the dangers he fears most for his regime and not uh, some tanks of NATO in the Baltic states or in Poland. This is our key message and I hope we can go through with this. Thank you. Uh, there has been <clears throat> wonderful editorials following the leadership of your statement in the um, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, as well as in Der Spiegel, calling similarly for a change in German policy. So, Sarah, are you optimistic German policy will in fact change? Or put another way, can current German policy survive a major Kremlin invasion of Ukraine? Oh, well, John, I think um, one can already see the beginning of a process where the German inconsistencies are really being laid bare. So looking at the feedback from the outside that our allies are giving us right now, every day, is pretty devastating from a German point of view. I mean, we've been called a almost like a Trojan horse of Putin within NATO and, and very harsh things have been said from all kinds of countries, from the Baltic countries, from Poland, from from the Anglosphere and so on. So I think um, this is the process that has just started. And we can see from these editorials that you mentioned, and there were many more actually, many, many articles in different newspapers from the left wing, right wing newspapers, even the very left wing Tats has called for a more strategic approach to Russia and China, which I find fascinating because strategy was almost a dirty word in, in German political circles until very recently. So I think there is a process now going on, like uh, facing reality, a very unpleasant reality on the one hand, and facing the feedback from the outside world. And this is initiating, I think, a process where our leaders will have to adjust the way they treat um, this problem and other problems these value conflicts are laid bare. For instance, Germany, I think, is usually acting from a self-perception of, of being on the right side of history, of being like morally the good, the good guys. But in reality, we have people like the CEO of Siemens recently saying we have to, we have to accept slave labor in Xinjiang because otherwise the transition to green energy in Germany would be endangered. And this is one also a perfect example of this model thinking in terms of being morally on the right side when you have these types of conflicts to contend with. So I think uh, what we are seeing now is an overdue debate. And I'm pretty confident that the statement that uh, Dr. Umland has drafted has really, really been catalytic in that sense and in, in bringing some of these value conflicts and some of these uh, really, really uh, strange mental gymnastics that our politicians sometimes uh, execute to the forefront of the debate. So I'm pretty optimistic there's change coming. Okay, Andreas, I see your hand is up. Can you, and can you just say, speak for no more than one minute so we can get to audience questions? Yeah, I mean, uh, as Sarah already ind indicated, there have been many more statements and there have been statements before before our statements already. I mean, if you look at the reporting of the Frankfurter Allgemeine, the Süddeutsche, uh, Die Welt, they have been very critical of, uh, of Russia before, calling basically for similar things. Um, the colleagues of Sarah at the um, Kiel Institute of Security Policy, Hannes Adomait and uh, Joachim Krause have made similar s statements, in particular Hannes Adomait had, has, had actually before redefined Russia from a strategic partner to a strategic enemy of Russia, uh, of Germany. Um, so th this sort of uh, paradigm shift has, has actually started before. 
we are, I think our statement is more a symptom rather than a trigger. And um, I think the main thing about the statement was that we got 73 people on board um, and, and, and many of them quite, quite prominent, uh, not only Rebecca, Sarah and, and, and Ruprecht, but also other prominent professors, activists who are um, reputed uh, Eastern Europe and security experts in Germany. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll turn to the audience questions. We have um, one from Serhi Kapanadzo. Um, he says, all potential sanctions which are discussed now are based upon a Russian in major new invasion of Ukraine. What would the international community do if Russia does not attack, but for example, they have Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic declare independence, hold referendum as in Crimea, and then are annexed by Russia, as the Russian Duma is now considering or discussing. So, uh, Andreas, if you could, I'll give you that question first. If you could answer in, in 30, 30 to 90 seconds. <laughs> yeah, in a way that refers to this issue with Nord Stream 2. What are we going to do with Nord Stream 2 if there's no uh, actually combat ex escalation? If there is just, let's say, an escalation in Russia's policy towards Eastern Ukraine, like uh, recognition of the so-called People's Republics in the same way Abkhazia and South Ossetia were, were recognized, or even an annexation of the so-called People's Republics. What are, are we going to do then? Um, that is to me also a question because the, the, the sanctions that have been imposed so far are minor and um, the effects that, um, that already now this escalation has for the Ukrainian economy uh, are significant. Um, there, you know, the, uh, the stocks are losing value, uh, also the Russian stocks are losing value and um, invest investors are scared away. So what are we going to do with that? And, uh, you know, I don't have a good answer to that. <laughs> you no, know, I, I, I think there should be sanctions anyway, as long as there is not a major policy change. Um, there should have been sanctions already in 2014 in response to the annexation and to uh, the events in, in Eastern Ukraine uh, that would go beyond merely some very specific technologies, individuals, and some very specific financial instruments. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we have a question from John Lau, who's written an excellent book on Germany and Russia. Um, Rebecca, I'll give this to you. Um, it is not just an issue of Nord Stream 2, he says. If Germany is going to help deter Russia, it has to signal that it will make revise its energy policy to reduce its gas dependency on Russia. Is there any possibility this will happen? Rebecca, please, a minute and a half or less. Um, so I'm still convinced uh, that uh, so uh, the um, West uh, is able uh, to fulfill uh, the energy needs, to comply with the energy needs um, in uh, our states, uh, even uh, in case uh, we would have to cancel um, not only the operation not yet uh, running a pipeline Nord Stream 2, uh, but even Nord Stream 1. Uh, we discussed it uh, before. Um, so uh, there are alternatives uh, for gas imports uh, available. Some uh, infrastructure is already prepared, even in my country, uh, not only in countries like Lithuania, for example. But this deserves real thought and it should be part of the strategy, of the security strategy of the EU. So the resistance against Nord Stream 2 was always in, in the European Union and in Brussels uh, combined with debates about uh, strengthening um, not autonomy, but uh, diversification of imports. So there are alternatives available, but we need decisions. Thank you. Nice and brief. Okay, we have a question from Marie-Louise Beck. Um, she asks, can you please discuss the role of France and Macron in the German context? And what do you think about Macron wanting to propose his own solution to Putin tomorrow in a phone call? Ruprecht, over to you. Please, a minute and a half or less. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure what he will propose, but uh, of course, you know, we are in the Normandy format together uh, with uh, Ukraine and Russia uh, to discuss uh, how to, uh, how to uh, let's say, uh, come to, uh, to, to, to a better solution for Eastern Ukraine. But um, now it is a danger sending mixed signals uh, towards Russia. 
Um, I would like to see a common approach from Germany, France, other European countries together with the U US and uh, uh, single steps from, from here and there, I, I see rather critical. And I really do hope that what Macron said, I guess yesterday, uh, that uh, he is not intending to do anything out of the, let's say, broad consensus uh, with NATO and, uh, and the US. I hope this will be true because uh, mixed signals in such a situation increase the danger of war. Thank you. Um, and if we have any enterprising intellectual listening in Paris, we hope that they could do something similar to what you folks have done. Okay, we have a, a somewhat provocative question, and forgive me if I mispronounce the name, um, Eoin Kavanaugh. Um, he asked, on Monday's call hosted by the President of the United States, in addition to the UK, Italy, France, and Germany, new actors were invited to consult on Ukraine, specifically um, EU leaders in Poland. Poland in particular will bring a more hawkish approach, in some ways also a more informed approach to interpreting Russian objectives and methodologies. How will German political elites, um, uneasy with Poland's conservative government, respond to having such a hawkish near neighbor now being engaged? Um, will it foster more or less German solidarity on Central European security concerns? Um, Sarah, if you could take this question again quickly. Well, it's true that there are a little bit of uh, there's a little bit of a tense relationship right now between uh, Poland and Germany within the EU for various reasons. But it is a fact that Poland was also like Ukraine, one of the key victims of German aggression during World War II. So there's also a huge chip of guilt, you could say, on the shoulders of Germany when dealing with Poland, which I think would lead to at least taking Poland's concerns seriously. So actually, I think exposure to the to the to the opinions of the actual neighbors of Russia, as already said, like Poland, is uh, very healthy for Germany. And uh, this doesn't mean that the other disagreements that exist be between Germany and Poland about unrelated issues uh, uh, are uh, somehow not uh, relevant. But in this particular um, field, Russia policy, I think um, Germany would do well to make use of the expertise that is present in Poland. And I hope they will. Thank you. We have another provocative. Actually, I see Rebecca's hand is up. Rebecca, if you could make it quick, then I'll turn to the next question. So I would uh, warn, explicitly warn uh, the German government uh, to be too skeptic now uh, towards uh, Polish uh, proposals and uh, Polish uh, expertise. Um, because this would, in fact, um, be very counterproductive and it would strengthen uh, the forces uh, in Poland, uh, which uh, the Germans do not want to strengthen. So uh, this, um, this attitudes and strategies uh, towards Poland also have to be uh, carefully reflected uh, case by case. Okay, thank you. Uh, a provocative question from Jan Piklo, um, taught, and it follows up this conversation nicely. Talking about historical memory, he asks, the issue of Ribbentrop-Molotov could offer a good lesson for Berlin, showing clearly that an alliance with authoritarian Russia is toxic, toxic and dangerous. Why is there almost no mention of this in the German public debate? Andreas, please, quickly. Yeah, I wouldn't overdraw, uh, overdraw this this comparison. This is also very popular in um, in Ukraine. You know, there has been even in mm. 2014, a so called Mrs. Ribbentrop campaign against Angela Merkel, which I think was altogether unfair. Mm. What I think mm. should be mentioned here is this whole sort of um, Russian attitude um, that um, is taking over the Soviet uh, World War Two history can be actually turned against um, the current Russian leadership by pointing to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and maybe not uh, so much to the first Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of late August uh, 1939, but the second Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of September um, uh, 1939, the Friendship Pact between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. So. Um, uh, the Soviet Union was an ally of, Na of Nazi Germany during the first two, uh, almost first two years 
of World War II. And, um, you know, and so the this whole sort of Russian rhetoric that, you know, the, the Soviet Union has this uh, impeccable anti-fascist uh, credentials is actually quite untrue. If you read the uh, this uh, Soviet uh, Nazi friendship pack or the the telegrams that, that Stalin and Hitler were sending each other or or, or Molotov and Ribbentrop were sending each, each, each other through 1941. So um, I, mean, I don't know, I, I think the, one, one should put, you know, this sort of comparison with, with Nazi Germany a little bit aside. I don't think the, you know, there is something to be said about appeasement. You know, appeasement is, uh, is something that has failed in the interwar period, but, and, and there are some lessons to be drawn from this but to, um, I, I never liked this sort of uh, comparison with, with a Molotov-Ribbentrop pact. Okay, uh, our time is up, so that's the final word. I would also add that appeasement towards Russia's aggression in the near abroad, Georgia, Crimea, has also failed. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, there'll be more on this subject to come from the Atlantic Council. And again, very great thanks to our speakers for joining us.